Um, hopefully you can all hear, hi. Hopefully you can hear without microphones because I think it will be a bit clunky. So if you can't hear, please um, let us know if you can't. Um, I'd especially like to thank Hannah for coming and sharing this evening with me. I think it's a real gift that we have a parent um, from the lived experience here tonight. So thank you, Hannah. Um, I'd like to start by just, um, we want this to be a safe space for discussion, for questions, for talking about various issues, and sometimes these discussions can be triggering to people. Um, so just be mindful of that, and if people do need to have a take, take a break and a breather, please feel free to do so. There's rooms just out there, you can, there's a library with comfortable chairs. And if you feel like you would like someone to go with you, if you're here on your own and you're feeling like you'd like someone, Peter McKenzie will now stand up. <laughs> who's the uh, carer academic here at, um, and has a special interest in BPD, would happily go with you. So just be, just look after yourselves, basically. Um, so just to start off with, we'd like to get a bit of a sense who's here this evening, because you've heard about us, and we'd like to know a bit about who's here. So just by showing of hands, if you could just raise your hand if you're, if you see, if you come here primarily as a worker. Put your hand up if you're primarily a worker. Okay, have a look around and see who's in the room. Um, could you now put your hands down? My son says, that's not Simon says. Um, put your hand up if you're um, a service user, consumer, whatever, client, a couple of people. Um, hand up if you're a family member or friend of somebody with BPD, and lots of those, great. What about more than one hat? What if you're here with one or more, more than one of those? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, just another show of hands if you've had um, again, just so I can see personal experience of BPD, either as a consumer or a family member or friend or neighbour or whatever, that you've actually, let's go, it's about half of the room. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and I'm one of those as well. Any one of those? Yeah, I was going to say that. I actually probably should have <laughs> All right. Great. So we've got a bit of a mixed audience, so, which is lovely. Um, so uh, there'll be lots of time at the end for discussion. Just to start off with though, I'm going to um, orient us a little bit to the voices of children. We're here tonight to talk about um, obviously parenting with BPD and part of that is, is children and often children's, um, particularly young children's experiences and voices are, are it's hard for them to be heard. Um, so I'm going to play a very short um, DVD which is not particularly about BPD, it's actually uh, made in Queensland and it's um, it's voices um, and some animation of children and young people talking about living with mental illness. And of that, there's some specific mention of what is clearly BPD. So if you just give me one minute, because I just need to... Um, and maybe Peter could do the lights. Mm -hmm. Times when she's gone to hospital and she's been self-harming, like hitting her head or cutting her wrists. I end up having to call um, 
triple O or having to go and stay at one of my friends' house. Mum having a mental illness and Adderall, I think they're, they're related because um, when you don't know um, how to, um, when you don't know how to control yourself or how to control your emotions, sometimes you reach out for things that um, help you to relax, such as alcohol, that put you in a better mood, but really they don't, they just, um, it's actually depressing, it just makes it worse. All those memories of my father drinking, my stepfather, was when I was seven, and he would drink and get drunk and get angry and be abusive to my mother, and he thought a few weird things. Well, we call it Wamba. When someone goes Wamba, they go kind of crazy. I felt helpless because I never actually saw mum and I didn't know what I could do. And when I did see her, I felt like running out of the hospital. I generally go into foster care and, yeah, so that my mum can get, try and get better in hospital. Yeah, it's, it's devastating to see that like that I have to go live somewhere and my brother has to go stay somewhere else. Sometimes I think it's my fault, but I don't know what I've done wrong. Grown-ups get sad sometimes, but it doesn't mean it's anyone's fault. So... I felt a bit alone and I didn't know really what to do, but then we called, um, we called the ambulance and we called the police and they all sorted it out for us. When I'm feeling down, I go into my room and watch TV or listen to music or go hang out with friends or talk to them on the phone when I have credit. Uh, I cope by... I sketch and I write poetry and songs and I basically <coughs> dress how I feel. I used to not be able to cope and I used to cut my wrists, which I know was bad, but I kind of did it anyway because I couldn't cope. Well, I always have emergency contact numbers and um, uh, I go to counsellors regularly, so does my mum, and she's usually on medication, so that um, makes me feel safe when I know that the doctors are taking care of her medication. You know, if mum or dad or someone else in your family is sad or angry or acting weird, it's not your fault. Wow! And sometimes it's good to talk to a mama or a friend, like a teacher, when things aren't right at home. And remember, other kids have worries too. You're not alone. You're not alone and there are people you can talk to and people who are happy to listen. Okay, so just just without just turn to the person next to you, um, introduce yourself, just for like literally just two minutes, and just just talk about what struck you about that film. Just the first things that come to your mind, just what you noticed, what you yeah, what what struck you about it. Um, you turn to the person behind you, or the person next to you, or on threes. Just literally for two minutes, introduce yourself. <laughs> We work together so we can try and, try and make somebody more. Yeah. So, do you guys work together? So we'll see. I'm also 
never really conscious of that when they are talking to students and how much information they are using. children and young people do experience. And some helpful coping, you know, helpful strategies for them to, to hear other children and young people talking about. So, um, so I'll pass over to Hannah in a minute, but just before I do, I thought I'd just go over quickly what we're going to talk about. Um, so we've heard from children, we'll hear from Hannah. Um, and then a bit more about what it, what, what it can be like for children, what we know children ex experience from time to time, and what gets in the way of um, us big people having conversations with those little people about um, BPD. Um, some key elements and considerations for what we think we know might be helpful for having those kinds of conversations. Um, and for parents. And then we'll have some time for some question, uh, some Q&A. Not Q&A, you know that's the ABC thing, but you know, discussion. Um, Hannah's very kindly bought some books that she's written that you can still talk about. Uh, and then we'll, I've got some resources as well that we can, other resources we can share. Um, so please feel free to ask questions or else write them down on the, there's some pens if you haven't got pens and we'll and hold that thought for later on. All right, I think we're actually running out of time, just about. Do you want to sit? I'll okay. stand for now. I'm going to move Forgive down. Forgive me if I just stop because this is all new to me still, only very early days. Well, as you know, I'm Hannah. I have a diagnosis of BPD. I um, also have depression and anxiety, but I kind of think they all go hand in hand. I've got three children, three boys. My eldest is 19. I've got an 11, or well, he'll be 11 next week, and then the three-year-old today. Well, he turned three today, I should say. Um, I guess I want to start off by saying I'm a survivor of suicide. I um, used to self-harm by taking medication anything and everything I could get my hands on. I wanted to be numb to the world, I didn't like who I was. And it was after, I think, the 30th trip to hospital that DHS got notified. And after a long battle with them, they took my two eldest children away. They just said, you know, you're a risk to them, that we don't want your children to find you dead. And even though I argued and I said, that's never going to happen because I was in control. I was also in denial because even taking one extra tablet is an overdose and it only takes one to kill you. So it took a long time for me to understand and grasp the concept of, yeah, I was self-harming and doing it with my children there, it really wasn't a healthy situation. It took me, I think, six years of fighting in and out of court to be able to get my children back. My eldest sadly went to live interstate with family and he still lives there now but he's happy, he's got jobs and doing what a 19 year old does. But Tom, he's my middle boy, um, he, he sadly went through the worst. He went from a few different foster carers and kind of felt like I, I'd left him behind and it wasn't the case. It was like I was having to give him to somebody else so that I could go and look after my own health because when I wasn't well, I wasn't nice. I mean, I would hear myself sometimes and I would think, geez, I wouldn't be surprised if I wake up and he's run away, you know, because I was just so horrible. I hated who I was, so I thought there's no way I could possibly be any kind of a good role model. I didn't want them to be anything like me and I had it in my head that 
if I wasn't here, then I couldn't hurt them anymore. And for a long time I believed that. And I had 58 hospital admissions before that last time when I died for three minutes. <clears throat> and I remember when I woke up in ICU the next day and I just thought, there has to be more to life. There has to be more than this because I can't be forever in this pain. I can't be forever this kind of mother because I want more for my children. I brought them into this world for a reason, you know, to love them and to care for them and I couldn't do that. So I had to learn how to be a better person and that first step for me was accepting my diagnosis. Every time the doctor would say, okay, so you've got BPD, I'd say, no, I don't. I'm fine. I don't have it. You're wrong. You know, just because you read it in a book doesn't mean that that's what I've got. But obviously they were right because <laughs> that's what I did have. That's what I have got. And then once I accepted that, I went out and I was sourcing all the information that I could find and I would read about it. But something I had to learn was because what worked for one doesn't always work for somebody else. So if I tried something and didn't work, I'd throw in the towel and I'd end up in hospital. I'd say, see, it didn't work. I told you it's not going to work. And then the next time and the next time. And then it took until there was an OT one day on one of the psych wards and she brought in some jewellery and she said, okay, sit down and make something. And I just thought, who's going to, I'm not going to be able to make anything, you know, I'm hopeless, I'm useless, you know, I've got BPD, I can't do anything. I kept using it as an excuse, but I did, I sat there and I made jewellery and I made necklaces and then, you know, people started liking it, they started wanting it and they, you know, they would be wearing it proudly and they'd say, oh, my friend made that. And so from that, it was giving me a bit of self-worth and a bit of validation. So the nights when I couldn't sleep because the noise in my head was so loud, I would sit up and I'd create something. And then the next day I could proudly go and show my friends and say, look what I did last night. So instead of thinking that my whole night was a waste of time because I'd been, you know, tossing and turning, I actually created something. And, I mean, it's only small little steps. But then that in time helped my anxiety. It helped me find an outlet that wasn't dangerous. And I was eventually able to get my youngest, well not my youngest, but at the time, <coughs> my youngest back living with me. And I remember one of the earliest conversations I had with him, he was, I think, maybe the, the age of my youngest son now, Oliver. I remember one of the first conversations I had with him when I come home was, Mummy doesn't not love you. I just don't want you to be anything like me. And he just was like, but why, Mummy, I love you? And I guess in his mind, he couldn't understand what that meant. And I was lucky enough, one of my support workers at the time gave me this book to read to him. It's called Big and Me. Just about this little tractor and his friend Big, and he gets sick. So when he gets sick, he's got to go and he's got to have his oil changed. And then, you know, and that says about when he's not well, what he does. Like, he'll go and do crazy things. He held me up all day because he thought people were after me. <laughs> and when I finished reading that to my son, he turned around and he said, so when you're sick, he said, do you need to change your oil? <laughs> oh, and that was, it was amazing. I thought, finally, he can understand. But at the same time, it's like, wait, he can understand and it scared the hell out of me. Because I thought, you know, he's too young to understand. Kids can't possibly know what's going on. But they do. And they don't want to upset us, so they, you know, they strive to do that bit more. I'll do that for you, mummy. I'll do this for you, mummy. Just so that they feel like they can help you and that's their, that's their way of showing you that they love you. Thomas and I, our relationship, I guess, every day we've got to work on it. There's a, because he's going through school at the moment and he has a few struggles. And I always have to keep this in mind. It's listen and respond, not listen and react. So if he tells me somebody's bullying him at school, straight away I want to respond with, well, you tell him, if he's got something to say, you know, and I go on and it's like, well, hang on a minute. Listen and then respond appropriately. 
because I do that all the time. I just straight away come out there and go, no, don't do that to my boy. <laughs> I want to protect our kids. But I guess one of the one of the hardest things is being able to remember that you're being watched. Everything that I do, my children are watching. So whether it's good or bad, I guess, they model from us, like any child would. But when you've got BPD, it just makes it so much harder. You've got to be more aware. You've got to be more in tune with who you are so that you can be in tune with who they are. Thankfully, in my case, with my children, I can sit down and have those conversations with them. And when they're struggling, I can... I give them that outlet to say, you know, it's okay to feel like that. It doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean that you're going to feel like this forever. It just means this is how you are right now. Because my mother, still to this day, is in denial. Everything I did or I do is for attention. You know, you don't have BPD. How could you possibly? You know, and it's like, well, why wouldn't I? Who's to say I can't? Every time I went to hospital, she would say, can't you find another way to get attention? And it's just like, you wouldn't say that to somebody that's got a terminal illness, that if they went to hospital to get treatment, that they're a bad person. It's just expected and accepted that you go and you get the help that you need. But I guess, you know, there are people that think out there, there's nothing wrong. It's all just this thing in your head to get attention. And so many times, I find myself having to justify, I guess, my feelings and my reactions to things and it's just like, no, if they don't want to understand, that's their <coughs> issue, that's not mine, it's not my job to make them understand. My job is to make my children understand so that they can grow up and be the next generation that will help create change. Because if everything's going to stay the same, we're all going to be here and we're going to be fighting this battle alone. So having our children understand and be intuitive to how we feel, I think that makes us a better parent. I think I'm a better mum because of it. Because if I hadn't learnt to what BPD was, if I hadn't learnt my triggers, if I hadn't learned how to speak to him or to any of my children, then it's, it's kind of like it's a waste of experience, if that makes sense. It's like... We're given these challenges, we're supposed to learn from them. So I've chose to, chose, choose, whatever that word is, sorry. I choose to take what I've learned and pass it on to my children so that they in turn can pass it on to somebody else. It's kind of like this cycle, it goes around and around. Knowing that when I see my 10 year old, you know, go up to a friend and he knows he's struggling and say, it's okay buddy, I see you. <clears throat> that just fills my heart with pride because I think, I did that. I helped him do that. But then you've got the other kids that watch him do that and go, oh, don't be such a sook, you know. It's so easy to just pick at somebody and kick them while they're down. But instead of doing that, congratulate them for it. Like, when, when you're supporting somebody that has BPD, I just want to run up to each and every one of you and give you a big hug because without you guys here to help us, our, our experiences are so much harder because we've got to fight alone. My mum didn't help me, so I kept a lot from her. I didn't tell her how I felt. I didn't tell her I'm thinking of doing this to myself today or I'm thinking about ending it all, all because maybe she'd said something to me that upset me. So now I can learn to be assertive and I have my boundaries in place and I can say, no, nah, don't want to hear that today and just, you know, hang up the telephone. It takes a lot to do that though. You've got to learn the skills. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn, you know, to not feel guilty about it because I guess with BPD that's a big thing. There's the guilt. Like some nights, even for me now, I can be laying in bed and it's almost like my brain goes, psst, are you awake? And you're like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And then you have this voice of, Remember in grade seven, that girl, and she said that? And it just starts off this whole big cycle. And then you're laying there for hours. And you go, what was her name? <laughs> it's just ridiculous, you know? And it just, it's kind of like, it's, it's trying to take something from you all the time. 
So it's like, if you lay down and close your eyes, it wants to take sleep from you. If you're having a good day, it will try and, you know, play those head games and make it into a bad day. It's, it, I have it like, it kind of feels like it's been owed some kind of debt. Like I did something to BPD and now it wants, wants to be repaid. But I just say, what well, I, I survived, I've learned how to live with it. I've learned to know that if I go into certain situations, that it's probably going to cause me anxiety. It's probably going to cause me stress. And it's probably going to make me feel like shit <laughs> at the end of the day. But sometimes it's just pushing yourself that bit further to go and do it that shows my kids in turn that even though mum was shit scared, even though she knew she was going to hate every single minute of it, she still did that and she did it for me. So being able to look at my kids and think, I might not be perfect, I might not be able to give them everything that they want, but they've got everything that they need. But they've also got one thing that, you know, five years ago they wouldn't have had, which is a mum. I recently found a diary that my son had been keeping. I know no privacy, you know, you shouldn't read it. And he had things in it like, I wish my mum could be happy all the time. I love it when she's happy. Or I wish we could go and do more things, but I know that it makes mum scared. So now that's my new mission, is to do stuff. Do more with them because that's what they want and that's what they need. And I'm not going to let BPD get in the way of that. I'm not going to let it limit my life anymore because I deserve to have a good life. My children deserve to have a good life. They deserve to be as happy as the next child is. You know, there's a lot of people out there in the world that are blessed and they're lucky and their children don't have to see, you know, a lot of what we go through behind closed doors. And they're lucky, they're the lucky ones. But if you can, again, change that and open somebody else's eyes that there are people suffering, then that makes them a better person. I lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> With my three-year-old, um, Oliver, his name is, he, he knows by looking at me in the mornings if I'm going to have a good day. Well, no, I shouldn't say that, if it's going to be a good morning. So I'm not a morning person, I'm grumpy, I'm moody. Don't talk to me before I've had something to drink. It's like, just don't. And they're all chatter, chatter, chatter. So it's just like, now they kind of think, Hey, mummy, can I make you a cup of tea? Just simple things like that. And it just makes you feel like maybe you are doing something right. Because it's not changing them. It's just, I guess, making them more aware to change other people and change things for others. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, for the supports out there, for people with BPD, it's really, really hard when you're in a psych ward with other people that have BPD because you mimic the traits. Like if somebody finds something that's good, chances are somebody else with the BPD is going to pick up on that and they'll follow that through. And But mm. being aware, I guess, that <clears throat> that's one of the tendencies of BPD, it can help you be more aware of a trigger. So when you're in hospital, you do all these things and they work for you, doesn't mean they're going to work for you at home. <coughs> Finding out that, I guess, I've had friends that have had diagnosis of BPD and they get stuck in that model of, I can't do this if I don't have X, Y, Z in my life. But you need to challenge it and you need to say, well, actually, I can have, I can have that and I can probably even have it better than what I thought I could. But you've got to be willing to, I guess, find out what your limits are and find out if... I guess it's going to work for you because if you give up, like I did many times, I wouldn't be here today, I wouldn't be standing here. I would have been, you know, just at home in my little bubble just doing what I do. But I believe that BPD is one of the diagnoses out there that just, there could never be enough said about it. It's just, it's one of those things that doesn't matter if there was 50 articles placed in front of me, I would still find something to write about. 
there's still something that needs to be said and there's something to be learnt. I guess um, me writing my books, I, I shut down because every time I opened my mouth to tell the doctors or the, or the counsellors how I felt, it would come out and I'd say, and I'd think to myself, why did I say that? I don't feel like that at all. Or else I would say what I thought they wanted me to hear and then I'd go home and I'd feel ten times worse. So I used to write it down. I used to think, it doesn't matter if I write that down a hundred times and give them the hundred and first copy. They're not going to know that there was a hundred drafts put into the bin. They're not going to know, only I will. And that used to help me be able to process it and it gave me, I guess, um, the strength to keep writing down how I felt. Because if I can give somebody one of my poems and they can go, that's exactly what I've been trying to say, that's exactly how I feel, then I feel like I've been able to help somebody else start their own journey into recovery. And I don't particularly like the word recovery because it's like something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. But I don't think there's really much else of a word out there that could be used. But I like to be able to say that, yep, I'm still learning every single day and I am on this recovery, but I'm aware that I need to stop and check myself sometimes because I can be the worst, horriblest person when I'm not in the right mindset and I just go, Hannah, chill, come on. You know, you just got to pull yourself back in line. It's hard to do, but we all have to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Should we pause it there for there's lots of what Hannah has said already that um, I think pick up on the, some of the things that I think are really important in terms of what are the huge, the huge challenges. And it was beautiful to hear you talking about um, the way that you've managed to talk with your children and give them explanations of what's happening for you. Because I guess one of the things that I really want to emphasise tonight is the, the importance of doing that, but also the challenges around doing that for all of us. And I put myself in that... Um, so, um, this picks up on some of the things that were in the film, but also from what Hannah talked about. But um, this is some of the things that children have talked about um, to all of us at different times. I'm sure Hannah would relate to some of these. Uh, and often these are, are sort of unspoken. And I think one thing that I've noticed over the years is that children, and I think you mentioned that, they're very, children can be very, very watchful, can be very, um, it's called sort of hypervigilant, but really watching out for how their parent is at any given time, watching for warning signs, <coughs> following them around the house and those kinds of things. Um, so these are just some of the things that we know that children from, from quite a young age can um, experience. And again, Hannah's talked about some of those, about um, Tom. Thomas or Tom's you call him? Either. <laughs> Depending on what's happening. Yeah. Um, asking questions about how, how she's going. Um, and these are the kind of perspectives that we know that... Um, come into the, into the space. So parents, and again Hannah has, has spoken about this, the kind of the guilt and the shame. So bringing into the space um, that they're no good as a parent, that they've somehow failed, and that children are better off not knowing. And that's this urge to protect. We've all got that urge to protect children, but um, we also know really clearly now that not telling children is actually much more um, challenging for them. And the, young, the younger that they get an explanation that they can make sense of, the better. That workers, and we would all do this at different times, kind of come to all kinds of conclusions about children. Assumptions, judgments, causations, all kinds of things. And make statements like, oh, those poor children. And I've heard workers say that to the parent or parents, your poor children. Um, Workers feeling understandable, they haven't got the time, the skills, the confidence to actually raise it with, with the parents or family about the importance of, you know, how are things going with the children and how can I support you in your parenting? It's that can of worms. Who's heard that expression about the can of, I'm not having that can of worms. Mm -hmm. It's not my role, not my job. Somebody else can do it. I haven't got time. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. And children's um, perspectives that it's their fault um, that they're confused and worried and they're trying to make sense <coughs> of this puzzle in their head um, and that they need to fix it. That children need to, if I'm just good enough, then um, it'll all be okay. So maybe some of those will be resonating for people. So we, addressing that elephant, and one of the books I've got here, I'll show you later, is called The Elephant in the Room. 
and I call it, and I think Hannah has spoken to me about this as well. Oh, there's the elephant in the room. Yeah, I see him too, but nobody wants to talk about it. And the elephant is really, we all have lots of elephants in our own rooms, I'm quite sure, I've got lots. Um, but this is really about the, how, the, in this case, BPD is impacting on everyone's lives, on parents, on children, on family, um, on community. So I just wanted to talk briefly about why uh, we, we know that it's really helpful for mental health issues, whether it's, B, in this case, BPD, to be discussed. Despite various obstacles, we have to keep thinking about ways that we can talk amongst each other in our workplaces, um, within our, our, our circle of friends, community, and with the families we work with. Um, that talking to children really does help. Uh, it's, it's, it stems confusion and fear, and also um, there's research that shows it actually does contribute to children being more resilient. And I actually have the pleasure of knowing Tom um, a little bit, uh, your gorgeous son, um, through this other program that I run, it's a mentoring program, and one of the, another young man that I, I've worked with for a while now is a mentor to Tom, and Tom is just, just a gorgeous boy, he's just lovely, and he's got some really beautiful traits um, that we notice all the time, and that we feed back to him and feed back to Hannah. Um, encouraging families to talk it's about, you know, how we used to not, not, not talk about um, the great taboos were sex, sexuality, death and dying, homosexuality. I think we've kind of moved a long way, but there's still a big taboo around um, talking about mental illness, and in particularly, I think, BPD. Um, this is the, my rationale for why we should be doing this. <laughs> that We also know that intervening early and having... Um, understandings around BPD mental illness make a difference and that talking with children is one of the things that promotes resilience but we know that all these things get in the way um, parents um, certainly the parents that I've worked with say it's, it's really hard to that's why I'm really in awe of Hannah's uh, capacity to talk to her children can be can be very triggering that the, the uh, complex trauma and fear of re-triggering can prevent the conversations happening. Um, children can feel very conflicted. They can be, they're extremely loyal in any situation. Children are very loyal um, and can feel confused as to what to do. You know, do they believe what their parent is saying, the other parent, or the grandparent, or the, the teacher, or the, the best friend? So we have to be mindful of those being played out. Um, a lot of parents are incredibly fearful, and again. Um, Hannah's talked about that. Um, they've had very negative um, contact with services. And for the people in this room who've had contact with services, hopefully they haven't been all bad, but I bet you some of them have been very bad and very negative. Not just with child protection, but with um, work services being very judgmental and very blaming and um, not trying to understand that perspective. And that can really get in the way of the sort of alliance between the, the person with BPD and, and, the, and the worker. Yeah. And a lot of practitioners just don't see it as part of their job. They don't have the skills or confidence to do it. So um, I think we might actually, we might have a bit of a, a break there, just to see if there's any, the, those, um, um, we've, I think we've got a pretty good sense of um, some of the really big challenges for um, for parents and the children we're getting a sense of that and some of the challenges for us as adults in our different roles. I thought it would be helpful just to maybe talk a little bit about what we know is helpful. And I'll go through these quite quickly because you've got them on the handout and I'm very happy to send these slides to you if you want to because we've got your um, contact details and I want to leave enough time for some discussion and talking about resources and for Hannah to talk about her books as well. Um, so, what do we what do we know, or well, we think we know, we're pretty sure we know, <laughs> um, is helpful. Um, so, and this is what children have said. It was a pretty big study done in the UK, actually, in Leeds of young people who had a parent with a mental illness. And this is they were asked, and including BPD, they were asked what what's helpful. And this is what they said. 
um, they want a two-way explanation, which is about what's helpful about them and what's happening for them, and what they might be feeling and what they might be experiencing, as well as what's happening for their parents, because they love their parents. So they need to know both. Um, and we have to be mindful of how, what their age is um, and what they've already been told, what they've made up, what their own stories already. So you can't just dismiss what they've decided, like, don't be ridiculous, that's not right. We have to be incredibly respectful of what they've already um, made up. We also know that having access to another adult, uh, it says neutral there, but it can be any other trusted adult. Clearly for Hannah, her mum wasn't was that one of those, would that be right? Yeah, that's right. Um, but for many people it is a mother or a father or whoever. Um, and that the child or the children can contact at any time of the day or night. So they can pick up the phone if it's 3 in the morning and it's going to be okay. That's quite tricky, but the best way that happens is if it's done with as a family conversation, so that there's no going behind the back to ring somebody up, but that it's a clear plan of what the, children, the child does at different times. And that third point is really about the understandings being on the same page, so there's no um, triangulation or... Um, Secrets being kept that children uh, are told, well, you can't tell, you know, grandma that we've spoken about this, or you can't tell grandpa because then they get really caught. And that can happen a lot in all families, um, but in this situation as well. Children also talked about they uh, addressing their fears, and these are fears, it's a bit like my mum or dad's going to die, a fear that they will catch the illness, so they'll be like mum or dad, or they'll, it'll automatically happen to them, that they've caused it, that their parent may die, or that they won't see their parent again. And so a good example of that is, is when a, child, a parent goes to hospital because of their, uh, their illness, and children not being told <coughs> what's been going on, um, and given opportunity to go and visit at the right time, and in the right, with the right support, going to visit their parent in hospital. Um, hospital inpatient has improved a bit, <laughs> and lots of them have family rooms um, just outside the ward or just inside the ward, um, which are much more conducive to um, visiting. <coughs> we also know that um, it's helpful for children to learn they're not the only one and meeting other young people. So uh, diminishing an isolation that they're, they're the only one in the situation is really important. So through peer support programs or information books, just saying, there's lots of other kids in this situation. You know, I know there's lots of other families who are dealing with this right now. Those things are very powerful. Um, being conversation ready, I've put here just some thoughts about... I think um, we, we also need to be ready to talk about that parents with BPD have strength and expertise as parents that they may never have had acknowledged. They may never have had, um, and this may be what happened to you, Hannah, I don't know, that no one actually talked to you about your expertise as a parent, that you, you're the best person to know what's best for your child. Um, in my experience, that can be hard for lots of workers to say. Um, so I think just, just being thinking about that is important. Um, I think we've talked a bit about that. Um, I think talking with um, families about how help is asked for, how, when is the right time to ask for help, and who do, you, who do you turn to for help, and why that person as opposed to the other person. I think that's a very important conversation for children to be part of that wherever possible to be good as well. Um, these are just some, um, I think these are quite interesting, quite good prompts really. This is from... Uh, Addicted, uh, David Sachs, who is an American psychoanalyst who works with um, children who've got a parent with addictive behaviours, um, and he calls it time to talk. And I quite like those those principles to bear in mind when we're thinking about as a parent or as a worker talking to parents, things to keep in mind um, that children really benefit from. And um, the seven C's. I didn't cause it. I can't cure it, I can't control it, I can care for myself by communicating my feelings, making healthy choices and by celebrating myself. And I think they're really nice um, 
they would reply to everybody, I think, or to all of us. Um, but I've used that in groups with children, really quite young, you know, sort of lower primary, upper primary school, and it's really powerful. Um, they come up with other things for the C's as well, you know, cake and <laughs> chatting and you know, stuff like that. But I think they're quite so they're on your um, they're on your slides. Um, I just put up that there because I hopefully that will help us to in terms of talking together. I think uh, finding a language for BPD that we all um, how do we explain it to each other? How do we explain it to our friends, family, and how do we explain it to children? Um, what words do we use, and how do we give it a context? Um, again, Hannah will be the expert at this in terms of um, how we do that. So I didn't, I don't have answers for those necessarily. I've just put them up there to help guide us in perhaps in some conversation that we might have. And I just wanted to remind us that um, parents living with BPD, as we can see, can and do raise healthy, happy children. Um, <coughs> like all parents, things can go wrong, you know, and there but for the grace of God, you know, we all as parents have times when it's very challenging and our children struggle with or without BPD or with or without any mental illness. Um, but children who have a parent with BPD and good support can and do develop extraordinary skills in managing adversity. Um, a sense of compassion, which I think Hannah's alluded to, and managing difference and tolerating difference. Um, peer support is incredibly helpful, so even if you can't get, uh, a parent can't access a, a, a group for other parents with BPD um, through like the BPD Foundation or another organisation, um, talking about there's lots of other parents like in the same situation is helpful. And early support, parenting support, as early as possible. And I think, again, somebody asked the question, what would have been helpful? You can have to talk more about that in a minute, Hannah. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put up that up there, because I think we can get very caught up in um, the, the difficulties. I'll leave that one there. So I thought we might... Um, I'll put the, this one back up. Um, has anyone got uh, one particular one panel here? Has anyone got, it can be about anything to do with what we've talked about. Has anyone got a, a comment or a reflection? It hasn't got to be a question that they'd like to pose. Julian. Um, Rose, I'm, I would be interested if um, the question, or the sort of elephant in the room question over there, I wonder if from your experience, you might have an example of talking with someone with, um, without using the words BPD and mental illness, but helping the child to understand things um, without using those words. I just wondered if, you know, it might come to you a situation where you might have done that. Um, it depends on the age of the child. I think. Um, uh, I think it's important to try and get a, a, a sense of what I'm um, asking a child. Well, what I, what I would often do is say to, to a child, t "What have you? Tell me what you've noticed. You know, when you know, I'm, I, I'm noticing as a good conversation to start off with. So I say, I've noticed that you like, you know, the colour. You're wearing a lot of blue, or I've noticed that you um, you smile a lot, or I've noticed that you've got blue eyes, or whatever." What do you notice about me? So I'll start off with talking about noticing, and we have a bit of a laugh, you know. And then, um, I've done this with children, and then I'd say, so what have you noticed about mummy or daddy? Let's say mummy or mum. And, um, and they usually will say something. I've yeah. noticed, usually it's crying a lot, or very sad, or very angry. And um, so just trying to get a sense of what they've noticed and trying to externalise that, so in saying, um, yes, I can, I can see that, that would, you would notice that because I think mummy is, but he has been sad a lot and crying a lot, and um, I'm just, what, you know, do you know why? Are you wondering, are you worried, and are you worried about mummy? So it's really just a question of extrapolating or trying to hear what they're worried about and what they've noticed, mm -hmm. and going down the path of just making sure that they don't think it's their fault. <coughs> Um, and if they're worried, giving them um, what I would call a sort of solution-enabling future. So saying that um, 
lots of children would worry about their mummy. I can see you're worried about mummy, but um, mummy is getting help. Hopefully they are getting help. Um, and trying to provide, so you're listening and then you're reassuring and then you're trying to explain a bit about it. Um, if it's behaviour that's um, uh, very unpredictable, um, you know, I would be talking about um, it's very important that children feel safe. Are there times when you don't feel safe? So it's pretty basic, really. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wants, one of the um, teenagers I once worked with, you talked about the importance, a bit like those seven C's. She said to me, I want to be listened to, I want to be reassured, and I want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I want some explanation about what's going on. And so I would very rarely um, talk about a diagnosis unless I had permission from the, the parent or the, the family in, in talking about it. But noticing is a good one. Because they do notice. I would always say to kids, you know, children notice everything. I bet you notice everything. And you just have a bit of a game about what they've noticed. And that can lead into... Any other? Yes. Anyone else? My first response would be, and again, please, people, please jump in. Mm -hmm. I have got all the answers. Would be to um, uh, sort of almost, if you can see that he's at a boy, he, he's um, con getting concerned and stressed by what he's seeing is to do lots of just soothing and to try and teach some self-soothing techniques for him so that um, if, if you're there you can, I mean, I, you can actually, um, you probably need to remove him sometimes from the situation if it's very distressing, I think. Um, but make sure that the parent, jump in home, that the, 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 his mum understands why you, do you do that. So when she's well, um, having a, an agreement, if you like, that what you will do if you see that happening, that you'll do these things to provide comfort and reassurance to him. And what kind of voice, like using a sort of a particular really calming, soothing voice that sort of, sort of soothes him and teaching her maybe some things that she can do as well. Um, music, you know, um, playing, playing calming music. Um, it's kind of like also, um, what would you normally do when a child is distressed? Yeah. You, you, know, you comfort them in some ways and knowing the child is, you know, the best way to comfort them or they respond to that, whether, you know, it's a BBD or not, in a sense, you know, children get distressed. And because you're an attachment figure, they're connected to you, they'll respond to that in a sense, picking them up and having a bit of a cuddle. With, you know, whatever sort of works in that sense, I think. But I agree with Rose, the idea that this is a kind of co-parenting situation as a grandparent yeah. and a person and, you know, talking about that, do you, do you think it would be helpful if I did that when they get a bit upset? It doesn't have to be because you're, you're not well, but do you, can I do that as well? So. I guess my suggestion would be books such as Big and Me. The earlier they can be hearing those stories, mm. the easier it is for them to be able to put into words how they are feeling. So he's 14 months, you said. Um, yeah, so reading a book like that, he might, you know, if he's feeling a certain way, that might be the book he brings to you because he's trying to tell you, read me this story because, you know, that makes me feel better. So, yeah, and I did mention to somebody in the break, there's another book I forgot to mention. It's called A Big Bag of Worries. Um, uh, you know yes, it's Virginia Ironside. It's a, people might know that book. It's a beautiful book and it's uh, on your handouts. So you can get it from any bookshop or Amazon or book depository. I think the, the point was being made about what, how, um, if the grandparent, if the uh, co-parent isn't there the whole time, mm -hmm. how children can be comforted and reassured in the absence mm -hmm. of another parent or parent mm -hmm. figure. And sometimes there isn't. There are going to be times when that parent is going to find it hard to comfort a child who's upset. Mm -hmm. And so all we can do is keep finding ways to walk alongside that parent and teach her or him and support him or her to do those things in the abs you know, when they're not, you're not there. So teaching techniques around self-soothing and using, you know, um, music and uh, all the things that people with BPD have to learn to do, recognising the trigger signs, early warning signs and having the 
things that de-escalate, all those things that you know they have to learn, mm. and how to comfort children. Mm. Great suggestion. Mm. Yeah, being creative. I love this your story about making, you know, the, your steps and making jewelry. Well, that was really mm. lovely. It's the same for children and, and finding, um, depending on their age, again, you know, journal, journaling or drawing, writing, you know. <coughs> writing or drawing how they're writing <coughs> songs, writing poetry, um, that's all really good. Just thinking off the top of my head now, um, I, I once used, um, you know the little coloured balls that seem to come with everything for kids and are everywhere, how they're in different colours, I used to have baskets of different colours and I used to say to Thomas, and he had just a little backpack and I'd say, um, the blue balls are for sad, the red balls are for happy and the yellow are for all these different things and then if it was a particularly bad day, I knew for me, and I'd say to him, if you're feeling sad, go put a ball into the backpack, and then we'd kind of count it out and see how many mm -hmm. there were. So if there was more of the red, and we'd say, okay, well, how, how about next time, if you have that many, let's try and, you know, come and show me, and then we'll try and, you know, rectify, mm -hmm. balance it out mm -hmm. kind of thing. Just thinking maybe something mm -hmm. like that might be helpful. Yeah, because it's really concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's concrete, just easy sort of for them to yeah. grasp the concept yeah, and go, well, yeah. I'm feeling sad, so that's the red <coughs> ball. Yeah. So even if they're sitting there crying their little eyes yeah. out, they can feel that bag full, yep. and that's, I guess, that's yeah. their way of telling yeah. you that I'm really, really yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah. Mm. the balls with Oh, you notice that yeah, the, they're really annoying. I hate them. <laughs> in play centers, they have those. Um, yeah, and but you can get them at Kmart. You can yeah, buy yeah, like a hundred balls or whatever. Yeah, there's just there's right green, it. yellow, purple, and blue, and yeah. just like for the young kids, I'm just thinking, yeah. you know, that would probably be really good. Give them a basket or something that they can just say, well, well, I know when I feel this way that I'll put that in the basket, and I don't know if you want to do it every day or maybe every week, count it out and chart it. So. That's a good way for, I guess, parents to be aware too, that think, mm. well, what did I do on that day that, that was extra? Did you look at your pack? <laughs> <laughs> no, but then it's kind of like a tool for everybody, because yeah, yeah. then you can go, well, actually, that day I did that, and I was pretty stressed, so yeah, yeah. and then, you yeah, know, yeah. kind of, that really makes you aware too. Brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I guess I did. Mm. Yeah. I'm gonna, you know, I refer to myself as the B word quite a lot, like I'm such a bitch. <laughs> so I just think, if I think that about myself, you know, what, 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 what must the kids think? So, so I guess I, I'm, I just, I just remembered that. So maybe I'll start putting that into practice for myself, mm -hmm. for the kids. Mm -hmm. Puff, puppets are good too. Mm -hmm. Finger puppet, just for a little mm -hmm. finger puppet, so you can ask the child, children to take a bring to bring a puppet to, to dinner or bring a puppet to bed and you know you can have a little play with puppets about what why if you have a range of puppets they can choose the puppet that they want to be part of the conversation they want to come and have a chat and it can be you know I remember one child we bought the crocodile because the crocodile wanted to eat mummy up mm. <laughs> pretty clear yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think this is what the well, lady was talking about Children need to process they do stuff, need to. but they need to process in these sort of acceptable, safe ways. And I think if we don't let them process it, then it yeah. becomes a real problem. Yeah, but including them in that, that yeah. makes them feel like they're able to help you yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 There's been a range of things. There's, uh, there's various models. <laughs> there's um, supported play groups, which is for children from not to five, where that pretty much is how it works. How it works, but that's with very young children. Um, I'm running a program at the moment, which is for children, but the, the, the children, primary school kids, but the parents are part of that. So the parents come uh, at the beginning. They have their own group where they um, they get peer support, mm -hmm. but then they come together at the end. And there's activities where they, we talk about what we've done in the group, what topic, because there's different topics, exactly, there's different topics. Um, and then we have group outings. So do you want to respond to that, what you think yeah. would be good or not? I guess, for me, I would be thinking, when I'm not well, I know I say things that I really shouldn't say, spur of the moment, you know, knee-jerk reactions. And I guess I wouldn't want my son to be thinking, for him voicing that concern that there's going to be a repercussion. Like if he says, I don't know, I can't even think of an example, you know, but if the, if it was 
known, I guess, from the get-go that whatever you say, there's not going to be a reaction. It's like, this is your place to say how you feel. We're not going to judge you kind of thing. Because I know if I say something sometimes and he goes and says it to somebody else, you know, when I hear it back, I, I'm horrified, you know, and I feel I want the ground to swallow me up. You know, but then he gets all upset and he holds that in because he's scared that I'm going to then not punish, you know, but yeah. hold it against him. So I, I don't know, I just keep thinking that if that space was created, then I think there's a, there is an opportunity for it to work. But I guess everybody would have to be open and willing to know that there's going to be some pretty confronting things. Yeah. Good idea. Well, from my experience, um, I voluntarily put my two boys into foster care because I had no support. And while it was voluntary, I was happy to get the help that I needed. But when DHS stepped in and told me that when I came home from hospital, I wasn't going to have my babies back, my my health declined badly. I was even in hospital. I was trying to, you know, kill myself yeah. every single day, any way that I could, because. Yeah. I just thought, I'm not a good enough person. I can't be a parent. You know, they, I had in my head that strangers could do a better job of looking after my children than me. Mm. And it was so damaging mm. for me. And I mean, I always cringe when I hear these kind of stories because I know being on both sides, now yeah. being well and in, the, in a better, you know, mental yeah. health state, um, I can see that when you aren't well, yeah. You know, that there is that, those really risks are there. Yeah. But, uh yeah. I've always had one person on my side um, believing in me from the get-go. Thankfully, he's still in, in our lives for the better. But... It was very few and far between. Um, Just reassuring me that yeah. once once I was stable and that I was better that you know I I could be a good mum and I mm. and I was it's just that I needed a little help mm. and I guess it is it's validation like mm. I guess with anything you need to be constantly validated mm. for yeah. you know I know that you're feeling really crappy right now but you've got every reason to be mm. but just know that it's temporary you know it's mm. not going to be forever but for me in that it, it took 11 months for my youngest to come back into my care. I say my youngest because at yeah. the time he was, mm -hmm. to come back into my care. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was one court, when I'd been at court and I'd been up all night and I'd had too many pills, probably shouldn't have gone there, but I thought I was doing the right thing. And I made a really off-handed comment that got me into this whole other world of trouble mm -hmm. that got to me, it had to be supervised, it had to be, you know, <coughs> And it really made it worse, but that was just my knee-jerk reaction to, mm. you took my kids away, so you've got to deal with my reactions. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. I do, I cringe when I, you know, and I do try and help, but um, it is, yeah. Look, it's one of the kind of key guidelines, you know, if we're a little bit clinical here, but I think it's really important, is that, you know, you should not work alone. You know, you should have a team, you know, you should, someone else, you should be sort of supporting you to do this. So if there's sort of, I imagine for Hannah, like how did you manage to kind of, kind of take take care of those knee jerk reactions? You would have had to learn some skills about how to do that. And yeah, I did yeah. DBT in yeah. the end, like dual behaviour therapy, yeah. which is retraining. So you needed a better yeah help. retraining so, my brain. So if that's not your role, then you need to sort of support the person to kind of get that sort of support as well. But to take on the whole thing. Is, is, is not a good idea in a sense. So you need to do it as a team. This needs to be a team. That might not be just in your service, but uh, other people that can work with, with the person around them managing, you know, kind of using mindfulness and other kind of techniques. Mm -hmm. other, it's other ones, it's quite family. dangerous for you and them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you kind of need a team for the family, a team for the kids, yeah, and, and then the somebody unit. for the yeah. mum. So yeah. it's a whole unit. Yeah. And yeah, there'll be the, all those conflicting things, but.
yeah. and somewhere to report back your mm -hmm. your the work you're doing with the person, so you can share mm -hmm. share that. I think it's a really core practice around the, you know the complexity that you can't keep this stuff and you shouldn't be isolated in your, in working with people with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I'm, I'm just aware of time because people want to get away on time. Um, we need to start winding this bit up because we're meant to finish at half past. And Hannah wants to spend a couple of minutes talking about her books. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah. Julian would like to um, say a few words about the fundraiser and I just want to show you some resources so we might be a few minutes over time if that's so can people be patient. Hopefully. Well, I just Sorry. wanted to say, I've got three books. This is my first. This is everything. It's like the good, the bad, the ugly, the hard to read, the horrible, everything. Because this is what, this was my diary. I started writing from hospital bed. I had nothing else to do. I didn't want to talk. So this is, that started it off. It talks about the suicide. It talks about, you know, the intentions and all of those things. Um, so if you have anybody that you are supporting and you can't quite understand why they do certain things, like they're toxic, they do these things and you just think, I wish they wouldn't do it. I think this is one of those books that can help you kind of understand that insight into that thinking. Um, and then I have another, uh, this one's called Death Didn't Want Me, Now I've Got Life. Then I have a second one here which I wrote while I was pregnant with my now three year old. It's very classic of the black and white thinking. I um, was in a relationship with my baby's dad and I'd go from being fine, then he'd call me and then the world was falling apart, you know, there's no in between. So um, I'm thinking for you with the, with the young grandson, this might help them with a little bit of that, just, you know, trying to help balance the out what's helpful and, and what's not. Um, and then there's the new one, which is called Taken, and this one is about DHS taking my babies away. Just how it, the effects that it had on me and how something as simple as education, I guess, and learning and understanding what BPD is and what would be helpful, it could have changed so much for us. We wouldn't have had to go through what we did. Um, learning, learning to let go and move on from that has been really, really hard for me because I see my son Thomas and he struggles. There is that wall still between us, although, you know, love all of my children, all of my, you know, my baby boys, they'll be my babies. There is that wall because he got taken from my, <coughs> forcefully, he got taken, you know, so many times that in the end I had to put that wall up. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to cry. I had to put that wall up so that I didn't break down every time. I didn't fall apart and for a long time I did. So this was the hardest one to write. It was just, it was gut-wrenching. But I kind of feel like now I've done it, I've been able to process it and move on. So, and um, I've got some available for anybody that wants to buy some today. I have them, there's uh, one for 20, two for 35, or there's all three for 50. Sign them all for you if you like. If you don't have the money today and you want some, I have some cards here so you can get in touch by either email or by phone. And you can also talk to Rose or to Anne or Rita. Um, I was going to read you something, but I don't think I can. I think I'll cry on you and I don't want to end the night with me crying. So <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming along. Um, I still think of myself as nobody special. I just like to try and help somebody if I can. So thank you everyone for coming along thank and listening you. to me talk. Thank you. Thank you. And there's also an evaluation form which is, you should all have, which we would really love you to fill in. Please don't just leave before you do that. Um, I'll just, shall I show you the resources now? Mm, sure. So, um, uh, so the Cockney website, really worth, I, won't, I won't show you, but the Cockney website has got some beautiful embedded DVDs, and one's on borderline personality disorder. It's young people talking about what, what it is in youth-friendly language, so I encourage you to have a look. That's the link. Um, they've put the BPD Foundation and the Blueberry. Huge Black of Worries is a lovely book. Big and Me, which is Hannah's favourite. That's Ford Street Publishing. 
Um, this is a great book. Let's talk about this is a flip book. This is for children and it's got explanations about different mental illnesses, including BPD. And this is the one for parents. Um, so, uh, Helen Carter is the FAPNI coordinator at Midwest. Um, contact her and she'll organise to send you. So, I'll leave them here to have a look. Um, this is the elephant in the room. You can't, actually, you can't hide an elephant. Um, you email me if you want copies of that because it's through a, a person with lived experience who wrote it, so I need to contact her. It's a beautiful, it's a great book. I'll leave all these at the front here so that you can um, have a look through here and bigger me. Should you? Thank you. <laughs> Racing to the finish line. Right. Okay. Um, just a little bit about the Australian BPD Foundation. Um, how it formed um, was maybe about six years ago now. And it formed because of the stigma, really, and the lack of um, information and the negative picture about BPD. And we heard a little bit about that tonight, um, particularly when it fills me with horror when I hear at mm. a registrar who sort of says, BPD, what's that illness? What? You know, and like he's a registrar. Mm. So, faced with that, with the sort of lack of knowledge around, and I was actually shocked when I first heard about this. I was shocked to hear that it's actually um, mental health professionals that have been perpetuating some of this stigma and mythology around BPD, um, like that BPD is untreatable. So, and it's really risky. So, oh, you know, no, it is treatable, and if it gets the appropriate treatment. The prognosis is good. So, um, because of the stigma and the lack of information, the lack of education around it for mental health professionals, let alone the community, and therefore the lack of services for people experiencing BPD and their families, a group of us decided, well, we've got to do something about this, we've got to change the culture. We've got to start getting some information and education out there. And we've got to promote um, the need for services to be accessible, like appropriate services that are going to help. So that's what we've been sort of working away at for six years. Um, we're a totally, um, band of, we're totally a band of volunteers. We don't have any um, in staff. And how we've been going about it basically is to run a national conference every year. Um, we're on to the sixth one this year and they circulate around Australia and we're trying to set up branches um, throughout Australia so that the branches can be continuing the work or can be promoting the work in their state. Um, and we've got the Victorian branch actually got this um, session happening tonight. So, um, we also created BPD Awareness Week and that's sort of been passed through the Federal Senate as the first week in October um, and we encourage sort of events to happen um, around BPD during that first week of October and this year, we'll be, well every year we run the conference in the first week of October. So that's to just explain a little bit about um, the organisation, national organisation, and tonight's been done by the big branch. Now, because we're a totally volunteer organisation, um, we do have to do some fundraising to sort of support our work. And our, we're having a fundraising event the last Sunday in June, and you'll see a poster sort of promoting it on your chair. It's basically a fundraising lunch at Lebanese restaurant where we'll have a sumptuous feast um, and we'll be having um, some little presentations, one from Hattie Peckham who um, is a neuroscientist, nurse and a person with um, BPD. We'll have a care perspective and a clinical perspective and it's going to be um, MC by Terry Labler, who some of you may know as a 
um, previously a um, radio um, presenter, and um, he's also a clinical psychologist with many years of experience in the field. So I think it will be an interesting um, session and a great feast as well with um, proceeds towards supporting the foundation. So if you, any of your friends, um, are in a position to come along and support the foundation in this way, please book in. I'd love to see you there. And did you want to say a few words in closing? Um, Julian, I thought you were going to close on behalf of the Minotaur Foundation. But if you're not, I'll come up and thank Rose and Hannah and thank everybody for coming. Excellent. Or will you have achieved it by the time I get there? <laughs>